Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled The Benefits and Drawbacks of a Multi-Cloud Strategy. Our speaker today is Miles Brown, Senior Cloud and DevOps Advisor at Tech Data Exit Certified. Miles has over 20 years of experience in the IT industry across a variety of platforms, recognized as an AWS Authorized Instructor Champion and a Google Cloud Platform professional architect and instructor, Miles has delivered award-winning authorized IT training for the biggest cloud providers. All right, lots to cover today. Before we get started, let's talk about the webinar functionalities. As you probably noticed, your microphones are disabled. So if you have a question, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the lecture, but post those questions whenever they come up. Today's webinar is being recorded and we're gonna send a copy to everyone who registered. We'll also share two promos at the end of the webinar, so stick around to learn a little bit more. All right, let's get started, Miles. You can take it away. All right, thanks, Michelle. Um, well, as Michelle mentioned, um, I'm a, um, you know, AWS and Google Cloud instructor. Uh, I've got pretty good familiarity with uh, Microsoft Azure as well. Uh, as uh, Exit Certified has partnered with all three vendors, the, the big three uh, cloud providers, and we do authorized training for all of those, as well as, you know, other vendors like IBM and Oracle who also have cloud um, we also, you know, are, are partnered with some of the DevOps kind of tooling that we might end up talking about at the end of the, core, the, the webinar, things like Docker and Kubernetes. So we have, uh, we have training on all that, and we'll talk a little bit about our training right at the very end. Um, but for now, uh, let's jump in. We'll talk a little bit about this concept of multi-cloud, uh, both the benefits and the drawbacks. That's actually, uh, that's probably half of what I'm going to talk about. Then what I'm really going to get into is the tools that make multi-cloud easier. So we'll look at those drawbacks and see how can we kind of, you know, lessen those drawbacks by, by the uh, right uh, choice of tools. So let's talk a little bit about hybrid and multi-cloud uh, to begin with. Uh, but, but first, you know, really the timeline of the major uh, cloud providers. Um, since the, you know, sort of, early 2000s, people have started building kind of private clouds in their own data centers using things like VMware. Um, but, um, but really it was around 2006 when AWS uh, became what it is now. Uh, some, of the, some of the services predate that, but it is by far the, the most popular and mature you know, public cloud provider. Uh, Azure is, is definitely second place. Uh, it came out in 2010 and Google Cloud came out in 2011, so they're playing a little bit of catch up. Uh, Google Cloud is, is is sort of very distant third, but they're really coming on strong uh, over the last little bit. And uh, like I said, you know, IBM and Oracle, they also have public clouds, but, um, you know, their their market share is, is, is diminishing because, you know, they are very niche, whereas the big three are becoming bigger and bigger every year. And um, I think... Early on, people would pick one vendor, and for most people, they picked AWS because, you know, they were the most well-established. And, um, and so you would have sort of one cloud and you would work with it. But then that thing started to seep in where they said, wait a minute, I'm starting to use a lot of AWS specifics. Or if you're a Microsoft shop, you start using some of the Azure specific stuff and you say, wait a minute, am I getting into the same situation I got into with you know, enterprise vendors in the past where I got vendor lock-in, you know, and people are stuck with um, Oracle databases that are very expensive and they push you forward and say, hey, you know, we're no longer supporting this old version. You got a paid upgrade, you know. And so, you know, that concept of multi-cloud started to pop in. The other part of multi-cloud is the fact that people, a lot of organizations already had an investment in a private cloud and they, they were using that. They didn't want to scrap it but then they did want to use some of the features of a public cloud. So that idea of a hybrid one is, is very popular. And so just last year, uh, RightScale, which is now Flexera, um, they, they did a poll of you know, quite a few cloud uh, developers and, and architects. And, and what they found was that 84% of enterprises with over a thousand employees 
have a multi-cloud strategy. Now, when they say multi-cloud, they include hybrid, and that's the bulk of it, right? Uh, the idea that you're gonna have multiple public clouds already, not that many people have that, but, but when you look at what people are looking into, it is very, very popular. So, so let's talk a little bit about hybrid, and then we'll, we'll concentrate the rest of the webinar on multi-cloud. So hybrid is very popular because you've got this existing in investment, and a lot of times it's something like VMware, um, running your, you know, on your on-prem data centers, and then you start to use some public cloud. And some people start off just using the public cloud as sort of off-site backup, to say, hey, you know, we've got this data here, let's also put it into AWS S3, and that's a very durable place to store it, it's off-site backup. Um, if something tragic happens in my data centers, I haven't lost that data, you know? Um, and they do a good job of securing it and, you know, and, uh, and very durably storing it. And, uh, some people use a hybrid cloud in what we call cloud bursting, where they're primi primarily running their workloads in their on-prem, uh, but in their private cloud. But, you know, when things get busy, they'll use one or maybe even more than one public cloud provider for excess capacity. We talked a little bit about this. I did a webinar yesterday just on uh, kind of comparing the different clouds. And I mentioned, you know, one of the companies that does this sort of cloud bursting is Zoom, uh, which have had to do this in the last month very much so because, you know, their business went through the roof. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they are able to run things normally in their, in their, you know, private cloud, in their own data centers, but they definitely need to use AWS and Azure when things get really busy. Um, so that's hybrid cloud. When we talk about multi-cloud, you know, for our purposes today, let's, let's just concentrate on when we talk about using more than one public, public cloud provider. And why would we do that? Well, sometimes uh, people want to run workloads in a particular cloud depending on availability or latency or price. Sometimes people want to redundantly copy data across multiple providers. And sometimes people want to utilize different services from each cloud provider. Right? And so that's sort of the three different ways that people end up using multi-cloud. Uh, that idea that, um, you know, I want to redundantly use more than one, that's, that's to say, well, hey, what if, you know, a particular vendor gets attacked or has some sort of major outage, you know, I want to be able to run things in multiple places. Um, but mostly it's, you know, trying to pick where do I want to run this workload because there are some differences between these different vendors, right? And so that's really, you know, sort of getting us into that talk of, of why do we want a multi-cloud strategy, right? So the first one is that idea, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? We've been, we've been burned by that before where we're stuck with one vendor and that means you're at their mercy when it comes to price changes, end of support for certain services, things like that, right? So just that, having that capability of saying, well, you know, we're primarily using, and, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to companies that say, uh, we're multi-cloud, but we're, we're cloud agnostic, but we're primarily running in AWS. You know, I hear that a lot. Um, so that's sort of one thing, just, just kind of that idea of being, um, uh, you know, able to move between vendors. Uh, probably the biggest reason though is, is what I mentioned earlier, that, that idea that um, I wanna mitigate against risk of some sort of outage, whether it's you know, natural disaster takes out a bunch of data centers or whether it's you know, uh, something, something more like they're getting attacked, you know, whatever it is, uh, that ability to move workloads around or have them running already in multiple clouds and being able to switch over. Um, that is interesting, right? So I got a question already. We're, we're going to get to the drawbacks and what the prices of it and everything else. Yeah. Um, so just continuing on with the benefits, um, the price flexibility is actually a benefit, right? If you have a workload, you know, different cloud providers uh, often have some of the same services, but their pricing models might be more advantageous to your particular workload in one versus another. Now, it's tough to be that, um, that flexible to run a particular workload wherever you want. But, but if you get a sense of for the kinds of things I'm gonna be doing, Google Cloud might be cheaper or AWS might be cheaper, you know, depending on what you're doing. And so that's another thing that comes in. Uh, but I would say the biggest reason I, I 
talk to customers that are going to multi-cloud now is because they want to take advantage of each provider's sort of sweet spot. What do they do well? So AWS has a massive market share because they were in there early and they have the widest breadth of services. They do a great job on, you know, they do a great job on everything. Um, but, uh, you know, things like serverless compute with their AWS Lambda and some of the other services around that uh, make it very, very easy if you're trying to take a monolith and break it up into little microservices and you want to run those um, without worrying about virtual machines and operating systems and file systems and all that kind of thing. Um, they do a great job of that. Now, Azure and Google Cloud both have that idea of, you know, sort of cloud functions. Um, but I think AWS is sort of the most mature around those. Uh, Microsoft Azure, they have their own sort of things they do really well. If you look at their PaaS capabilities, that's platform as a service, um, they'll take a .NET application. You know, if you're a .NET developer, you build up a zip file and you say, hey, I want to take this and go and make a nice scalable web application. And I don't want to worry about, um, you know, thinking about where to, where to launch VMs, how many to launch, making sure that if one dies, it gets replaced, you know, like all that kind of infrastructure to make it highly available and scalable. They take care of all that. Um, but of course, Azure can do that because, you know, they're more concerned with, you know, .NET and Microsoft specific stuff. They don't have to worry about every single language on earth. Right. Now, they have added support for other kind of platforms in this way, but uh, that's one of their hotspots. They do a few things pretty well. Right? Um, Google Cloud, if you look at sort of Google as a company, they, they developed Kubernetes, they developed TensorFlow, and, and then they open source those. So they're, they're open source. You can use them anywhere, but Google Cloud does a really good job of those, especially around the machine learning. And even though they have a small market share, you know, they have a good chunk of organizations that are really heavy into machine learning. And that's because they're building on the, the very, very deep expertise that Google has around this area. And so one of the things that I'm seeing now is I'm seeing companies that, you know, primarily are using AWS. They've got all kinds of workloads running in there and they've got lots of data sitting in S3 buckets. And now they want to start doing analysis on it, you know, and they're starting to look at machine learning and they're saying, well, we could do it using the AWS services, which are okay, but look at some of the advantages we have in Google Cloud around that. And so they say, okay, we're going to use Google Cloud just for that analytics part. And we'll bite the bullet and we'll move our data, we'll copy our data from S3 into Google Cloud Storage and in there, we'll go and bang away at it using the machine learning uh, uh, options that they have because I prefer those, right? And so we're starting to see that quite a bit. And in fact, that is a major marketing push from Google Cloud. You know, I went to their Google Cloud Next, which was their big um, um, uh, conference uh, about a year ago. They were supposed to have one last week, but it got canceled, you know, along with everything else. Um, and so last year, that was their, you know, they, they basically were pushing this concept of multi-cloud. And they even built, you know, some, some applications around it, something called Anthos, which is really based on top of Kubernetes to say, hey, you could build this application, you could run it on-prem, you could run it in any cloud, uh, but you sort of run it all out of Google Cloud as far as the, um, uh, you know, running the application. And um, that is their big strategy. Now, we talked about all the great things about multi-cloud. Uh, what's the downside? And there's a few, right? So we'll look at a few drawbacks. Uh, first off, as soon as you start splitting your spend across more than one vendor, that means you're not spending as much on a single vendor. And what that does is that you end up um, missing out on some of the volume discounts and, and enterprise agreements. You know, um, you know, most of these cloud providers have sort of a tiered pricing, like, like in AWS, just around storage in S3, you know, the first... 50 terabytes that you store costs about 2.3 cents per gig per month. And then the next 450 terabytes, well, then that goes down all of a sudden. Now I'm only paying 2.2 cents per gig. And then, you know, and then beyond that, if you're doing massive amounts of storage, if you're Netflix or somebody like that, well, then you're not even going to pay the, the retail rates. You're going to make an enterprise agreement and say, hey, I'm going to spend a million dollars a year on this, so you better give me a very good price, right? And so you lose some of that bargaining power 
when you start splitting things around. Also, this comes back to Vahid's question. Well, now that I'm, I'm uh, using several cloud providers, now I have to skill people up on multiple cloud providers, right? And there's going to be more costs associated with just that complexity, for sure. Um, so that's one downside. The next downside is security, right? Think about that. You have to now understand how, does the, how do the security controls work? What are the security controls in each of these cloud providers? And if I'm doing multi-cloud stuff, that just means more surface area to, to secure. So not only do I have to learn it, now I have to, in practice, make sure that all my security controls are set properly in all these different places. So security is definitely a concern. Um, you know, th there are tools that they have for securely moving data in and out of the clouds and certainly between the clouds, you know. Um, so it's, it's not really that um, it's, it's less secure inherently, but it's more surface area means less secure because there's more points of, of ingress and more, more places to have to secure. And then just that complexity in general that comes from having multiple management interfaces, multiple configuration kind of techniques, uh, multiple deployment tools, all of that makes, makes this multi-cloud thing, you know, quite a bit more difficult, right? If you build an application, um, is that application easy to deploy to all three public clouds? Probably not. Not unless I get some good tooling to help with this complexity. Right? And that's going to be what we sort of concentrate on for the next, say, 20 minutes, is what are some of the tools to help make this multi-cloud easier? Right? So what we'll see is that there's many tools that help ease these. A lot of these tools are not just for multi-cloud, but also hybrid cloud. Right? Um, and I, I would suggest that these uh, tools kind of fall into one of four categories. And, and these categories, I, I mean, I sort of did this categorization myself. I don't think you'll see anybody, you know, say these are the four, you know, multi-cloud tool categories. But let's start just with the idea of provisioning um, resources in each of the, each of the uh, providers. Uh, well, what you'll find is that each one has its own unique set of tools, right? So in AWS, they have a tool called CloudFormation, where you build templates, which are really just text files in either JSON or YAML, and you build it up and you say, okay, I need to set up a network, a VPC that looks like this. I want to launch a bunch of uh, virtual machines, which we call EC2, you know, and so it's, it's a huge file, or you break it up into mini files to be more modular. Um, but... If you want to do the exact same thing in Azure, well, they've got ARM, which is Azure Resource Manager, similar kind of concept. In Google Cloud, they have Deployment Manager, very similar kind of concept. But, you know, they're similar concepts, but you can't reuse the same script in all of them, right? So, so now you've got three different tools just to get your stuff going, right? Now, there are some more cross-platform tools. So um, if you take a, a configuration management tool, you know, traditionally you had Puppet and Chef and things like that. Well, Ansible has become sort of a very popular cloud uh, configuration management tool because they embrace this and they said, hey, if you want playbooks, that's what you call the sort of scripts in Ansible for uh, deploying infrastructure in AWS, we got playbooks for that. We got playbooks for Azure. We got playbooks, you know. Um, so that's sort of one option. Uh, Terraform is a is a very popular um, uh, infrastructure as code tool from a company called HashiCorp, right? And Terraform, uh, it's it's sort of um, the idea that you're not going to use the same script and say now deploy with this setup in AWS or in Google Cloud, you know, it, it's not like that. It's that you only have to learn one style of scripting and then you could build scripts for each of the, the cloud providers that you're using, you know? So, so they don't really provide our right once run anywhere experience, but they are say, sort of saying, you don't have to learn three different styles of scripting at least, right? Um, if you want more of a right once run anywhere kind of experience, that's where, containerization and orchestration starts to come in. So if you build your application into a series of Docker containers, and then maybe you use Kubernetes to, to do the sort of orchestration, well then you can launch your, you know, set up Kubernetes in any of those clouds, and then go and launch your application into there. 
And so the application code doesn't have to change when you move from one place to another. The, the deployment is very similar, but you do have to worry about managing, say, Kubernetes in each of the clouds. Now, there is some help there because the public cloud providers all provide a managed service for Kubernetes. So I would say that Google Cloud does the best job because you know, they invented Kubernetes. So they have something called GKE, the Google Kubernetes Engine. And so basically the idea, if you know anything about Kubernetes, is that they're taking care of the control plane for you. And right? so they're gonna manage that. You just have to think about, you know, hey, what are the nodes that are gonna make up your, your Kubernetes cluster? And then you go and start deploying to them. Um, very similar, uh, Azure has AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service. And in AWS, we have EKS, uh, the, the Elastic Kubernetes Service, I guess is what they're calling it now. Um, so those sort of provide it, but there is still that thing where you're gonna have to learn how to manage, you know, use those managed services in each, right? Um, there are some nice tools for just simply doing the deployment um, that, are, that are sort of cloud agnostic. Uh, Spinnaker comes to mind. This was something built at Netflix uh, and then they open sourced it. And so a lot of people are using it now and it says, hey, I wanna launch this virtual machine in AWS or in, or in, or in, and it can include, you know, on-prem kind of into VMware setups. Um, or it also incorporates Kubernetes and stuff and says, hey, I wanna deploy these pods to Kubernetes and then you just point to which one. So that's sort of one of the things we can do, but we kind of, we kind of lose some functionality when we want to be vendor agnostic, right? The idea is uh, if, if, if I wanna be able to move this workload around, then it can't really take advantage of some of the extra bells and whistles that that cloud provider uh, has for me, right? And so that's sort of, um, you know, a lot of times it's kind of platform as a service capabilities that we're losing out on. And, um, and that's a bit of a bummer, right? So what we see is that some frameworks have stepped up to provide sort of PaaS features to your application in a way that I can deploy the application and that PaaS framework into, you know, my own private cloud on-prem or an into, into any public cloud. And so the, the two sort of main ones that come to mind are OpenShift and Cloud Foundry. Right. Uh, Cloud Foundry is a little bit older. OpenShift has really become a lot more popular lately. Um, it, it sort of uh, is owned by Red Hat now. Uh, and, and it's based on Kubernetes, but what it does is it says, hey, not only are you, uh, you know, building pods, and, you know, the basic deployment unit in, in Kubernetes, but, uh, but we're gonna provide all kinds of services on top. And we're gonna do it the exact same way, no matter which cloud you're in. But that comes with its own costs. You have to now learn OpenShift and how to, how to work in that environment, how to administrate it, and then you have to pay for it too. And so, so um, there's always trade-offs with every one of these options, right? Um, now at, uh, at Exit Certified, we, we do Red Hat training as well, where we're authorized Red Hat training partner, training partner of the year. Um, they have OpenShift classes. They also have Ansible classes because they bought the company Ansible as well. So, so we do all those. When it comes to Cloud Foundry, um, you know, probably the most popular implementation of that is Pivotal Cloud Foundry, and we are partnered with Pivotal. We have those classes as well. Right? Now, the problem with everything we've mentioned so far, you know, the tools here, they're all sort of piecemeal. You know, okay, I need to uh, deploy some infrastructure. Now I want to build my application up in a you know, a, a vendor agnostic way and deploy it. Well, then you have to start thinking about, well, what about monitoring, right? Uh, if you look at monitoring, each public cloud provider has its own unique set of tools for that, right? In AWS, we have CloudWatch. That's a service that gathers metrics from all the other services. It also has a logging component. You can put your logs into there. Um, and it's very specific in how it works. Azure has Azure Monitor, same kind of idea. So they got Azure Monitor, they got metrics, they have logs, things like that. And in uh, Google Cloud, they, they, had, uh, they bought a company called StackDriver. And so they called it StackDriver for a long time. Now they've kind of tweaked, they, they, they're getting rid of the name StackDriver. It's called Google Operations Platform. And there are a bunch of elements to it. But one of them is the cloud monitoring, cloud logging, you know, so on, so on. And so, 
if you're going to launch things into multiple clouds, then you're probably going to have to learn how each of those works and use different interfaces to look at those or use some third party tool that can connect to any of them. Right. And so we see some uh, cloud monitoring tools that are just simply like network monitoring. You know, they'll, they'll gather the, uh, the log files from say your AWS uh, VPC your virtual private cloud, and they'll get the flow logs and you'll see all the traffic, right? And so there's some tools that do that. Uh, that's where Datadog started, but then they added in more application performance monitoring. And so most of the traditional APN uh, vendors, so like New Relic and uh, App Dynamics, you know, some of these tools, um, they, they added in uh, cloud support. So most of them first started with like VMware and, and popular private cloud options, uh, maybe, maybe OpenStack. Uh, and then they added in AWS and then they looked and said, oh, Azure is pretty popular, add that, you know, and so they keep adding. So if you look at something like New Relic, you know, this is a very popular kind of application uh, performance monitoring tool. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, February 2018, they added, you know, multi-cloud monitoring support. And so you can get sort of one pane of glass. I think they have an example here somewhere. Let's click to enlarge, you know, one pane of glass where you can see what's happening in AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and, you know. So the idea is that they have kind of um, hooks in. So what are they using under the covers? Well, they're using exactly the same tools from AWS or Azure or from Google Cloud, uh, but they're interpreting those and building nice, you know, kind of canned analysis for you and then the ability to add in your own analysis on top. Right? And so, so there's a lot of those kind of tools. Datadog has become a, a pretty popular cloud monitoring tool. Now, these tools are not cheap, by the way, right? So, like I said, you know, once you get into this multi-cloud, uh, adding the tools in is going to increase your cost. Something like Kubernetes, it's really just, you know, learning it and stuff like that. But, but uh, when we get into the real tool tools, you know, commercial products, then you're starting to cost money to add in this. Um, yeah. Um, so I think uh, that's cloud monitoring. Now, the next couple uh, categories of products are things like a cloud service broker, right? So cloud service broker is usually concerned with, you know, like let's track our spending on each of these clouds, right? And so, so they're gonna provide some governance, self-service so that, you know, your, your, uh, your IT people and your finance people are kind of happy, right? So that we can, we can say, well, you need to be able to launch things and you wanna launch them wherever, but let's find the cheapest place to run that kind of workload. And then let's, let's find out, you know, through one interface, you know, who's allowed to launch things where and let's figure out what what the costs are going to be and and then you know sort that out over a company and and what groups are in that company so it's um it's a it's that kind of an idea but it's it's a little smaller in focus it's really around the um you know who's allowed to launch where and what are the costs involved and getting a good idea of those costs what we'll start to see now is kind of bigger more encompassing uh, tools called cloud management platforms. And they'll typically provide those same functions as well as real management and monitoring options. So you don't have to go and get 50 different tools. You might get one tool to rule them all. Now, a lot of times these tools, they might have hooks in. They say, well, you know, we've got a little bit of monitoring, but if you want to use some third, you want to use New Relic, because you're used to using that already for your on-prem stuff, you can, you know, you can hook into that from our cloud management platform. Um, but they're going to add in, you know, automation, orchestration, both for individual virtual machines, like launching these workloads, you know, these, these uh, VMs wherever, or maybe at the Kubernetes level, launching applications. Right? Um, they might even include service requests, cloud inventory, multi-cloud migration, multi-cloud backup kind of stuff. Um, and so that's, that's what these sort of tools do. Now, what are those tools? Well, some of them are the more traditional uh, ITS, uh, uh, ITSM tools, like, uh, like somebody like ServiceNow, right? Um, so if you're a big enough organization just trying to track 
spending on on IT is you know a real pain, and so they might use some sort of IT service management tool, and a lot of those have added some cloud capabilities to them. But if you look at what are the real top cloud management platforms, um, this was uh, from earlier this year. This was the uh, Gardner Module Quadrant. You know, somebody like VMware, they have a cloud management platform, but it's it's a little bit smaller in focus. It's saying we're assuming you're using VMware, you know, for your private cloud, and then VMware on AWS or VMware can also run in, in Azure or Google Cloud. You know, they have ways to make those things work. So, you know, if you want sort of one pane of glass to manage all these things, you know, they have their cloud management platform, right? Um, uh, if you look at the Gardner Magic Quadrant, the, sort of the two biggest ones uh, traditionally have been Morpheus and uh, RightScale. Now, RightScale is now called Flexera, right? And so they've got uh, some pretty nice tools for managing and governing across public and private clouds. And, uh, you know, here's some of the things you can do with their multi-cloud management. You know, uh, unify the visibility of public and private cloud resources and uh, leverage reusable blueprints to orchestrate infrastructure and service across all of your clouds. So that's what they're trying to provide is, hey, we're gonna give you a way to say, you know, what does this infrastructure look like and then you should be able to say, now deploy this thing here or here or here. Now under the covers, you're gonna to have to do some extra scripting to make that happen, right? But that's, that's the idea behind these tools. Uh, uh, Embotics got bought by Snow Software, so it's called Snow Software. Um, uh, Cloud Bolt, Scaler, and then there's 40 more, right? I mean, that's the thing. Uh, some of them, you know, you might consider more of a, you know, just a management tool uh, or, or, or a full cloud management platform, or some of them are just brokers. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, Ted asks, well, didn't see Cloud Checker in here. Um, yeah, Cloud Checker, if we just go look at that one, there's no E in it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's Cloud Checker. They consider themselves a cloud management platform as well. And, and they are definitely in that, in that running. Um, they, didn't, they didn't make the, uh, the Gardner Magic Quadrant. Now there's lots of reasons why they might, you know, they might not uh, want to participate or something. Um, but again, it's the same kind of concept. So they've got the cost and management side, uh, um, the uh, resource utilization, and then they've got the automation component and the security and compliance. So once they get into the automation part, that's usually the difference between just a broker that's around, you know, making, making sure we can track your costs versus really managing things, you know? And so that's, that's really where they come in. So, like I said, there's about 40 more, you know, and they all have sort of what they do well, what they don't do well. I'm not telling you which one's best. Um, I, I don't know. You know, all I know is that um, I know who spends the most money when they when we go to like a, an AWS event or something and they have the biggest booths and I talk to them. I do go around those trade floors. I mean, for me, that's the best thing about going to those events. You know, they've all been canceled this year uh, or they go to like more of a, you know, uh, a virtual conference. And, and what you miss out on then is that ability to just walk the expo floor. Uh, you got to be careful. Like you go to something like AWS reInvent, there's people just running from booth to booth trying to get swag. Right. But uh, that's usually the opening part, maybe the next morning. But then after that, later in the week, I walk around and I just talk to people and get a sense of what's your tool like? How does it differ from this tool? Um, and so I, I would really suggest that, that that's, that's the best thing I think that comes out of those, those conferences because very typically those conferences, all the, all the sessions are online you know, fairly quickly after the, you know, so you, you don't have to go and, and sit through the sessions necessarily. You can watch those on your own time. Um, so that's something, that I would consider. Um, we got a couple other calls, uh, uh, questions. Uh, can these CMP tools use, be used for traditional hybrid cloud management tool? Uh, yeah, I would say definitely. Um, cloud forms is an interesting one. So, so there's a couple of products, like a category of products that we didn't really talk about. You know, when we, uh, sorry, let me get back to my slide earlier. 
When we talked about these PaaS frameworks, we talked about some of the tools around this, uh, Kubernetes and things like that. You know, I was sort of concentrating on the, uh, the frameworks that are really for multi-cloud, you know, you're, you're using some cloud provider. There's a couple of tools that people use just to build not so much PaaS, but, but the infrastructure as service. Like if you want to build your own private cloud, right? And so OpenStack is probably the biggest one. Uh, and then cloud, cloud stack is an Apache product. Um, and so there's a bunch of those kind of tools too that are sort of for, for building your private cloud. And if you're gonna build a private cloud, you know, how, how to kind of do that. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to sort of uh, dealing with both the private cloud, whether it's a, a commercial one like VMware or something more open source, um, you know, a lot of these CMP tools can talk to all of those, right? And so if you, if you go back and we look at some of those um, CMP tools, like let me grab one like Scalar. I think they've got the, the list of multi-cloud support. Oh, you know what? This one doesn't have the list that I was looking for. Um, maybe one of these other ones, CloudBolt might have the list. I just want to see the logos. Ah, yeah. So here, yeah, they talk about being able to talk to OpenStack, Azure, VMware, AWS, Google Cloud, Nutanix. Um, you know, so all kinds of both public and private cloud stuff, as well as container stuff like Kubernetes and infrastructure as code like Ansible, Puppet Chef, Terraform. And, and you want to be able to kind of manage all of that from one place. And so that's what these tools are typically doing. Um, so they're sort of sitting in between the business and IT and the, the, the tools that we're using. And um, let's see. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say was just, just to show that, yeah, they can certainly talk to a variety of, of you know, both public and private. Um, all right, so let's get rid of that one. Uh, Vahid's got a, a good uh, a note. He says, it's going to be difficult to convince the management as well uh, to use several tools and approaches. Uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, the organizations that I've seen this happen in, it's usually from the top down, right? So, so typically your, your individual like IT practitioner, they learn one cloud, they're happy with it, then they don't see a reason to go beyond it, right? It usually comes from the top down. The CIO talks to some other CIO who says, oh yeah, we, we had to go multi-cloud. I mean, sometimes the multi-cloud thing happens organically, just in big organizations, you've got, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing, right? And so I've definitely talked to organizations where, you know, one part of them is an AWS shop, the other part's an Azure shop, right? And eventually, you know, it trickles up where somebody says, hey, uh, we, um, we need to figure out our cloud strategy. You know, we are spending money on different clouds. Does that make sense? I, I like the idea that we have expertise in both, but let's, let's really try and formalize that and make a multi-cloud strategy. Right? Or somebody's, somebody's not happy. They have some huge outage with Azure and their company's kind of in trouble for a while. And they say, we can't have this again. You know, if you look across the three major vendors, you know, Azure seems to have the most outages and, and AWS probably the least, right? But, you know, sometimes it's an event that causes us to think, oh, okay. You know, I mean, very often early on in the cloud, people were running just in one region and then every once in a while, we would have an outage of a region, and that's when a bunch of companies would say, hey, my company has to work even if, you know, part of AWS is down, right? So I need to use multiple regions. And then eventually, they get to the point where they say, maybe it's bigger than that. Maybe it's multiple cloud vendors, but it's generally coming from the top down. And so if you're trying to make a case to your boss, I don't know, it, it, is, a, it is a hard pill to swallow because we said, you know, if you're going to add the tools in, that's expense. Uh, just having to learn multiple clouds, that's an expense. Trying to secure them, right? Um, so there's there's definitely some some things in there. Um, uh, Akash asks, how does OpenShift provide paths in a way that gets the subscriber of OpenShift the extra bits and pieces of the uh, infrastructure services from each of the public cloud service providers? I mean, it's not so much 
that they're tapping into the things that the cloud providers have. It's that it, it provides uh, some of the same kinds of things that are common amongst all of them, but they're doing it in a way that is, you know, uh, I only have to learn OpenShift. I don't really have to learn anything about, uh, you know, somebody in my company has to be able to figure out how to, how to, you know, um, provision the basics of AWS or Azure or Google Cloud and get OpenShift set up in it. But beyond that, um, most of my practitioners just have to learn OpenShift way of doing things, which is really Kubernetes, and then we get some extra pieces. And right? so that's sort of, um, that's the idea. It's not that it's hooking in and, and taking advantage of the extra things of the cloud, it's providing some of the similar kinds of ideas. All right, we have another question. Um, as far as I know, the management are focused on company's core business. The rest should be based on simplicity and application balance between cost and security when it comes to information. Um, sure. I mean, I think if your management doesn't think about um, their reliance on one supplier, they're, they're doing you a, dis a disservice, right? Uh, so I think, I think it depends on the management. I, I've definitely seen multi-cloud in many, many organizations and many more considering it, right? So, um, and, and the places where I've seen it, it has been sort of a top down. Right? Um, okay, Michael Johnson says, sometimes the business requirements dictate MC, An example where data sovereignty come into play and or latency and availability, uh, MC. Not sure what MC stands for. Uh, I'm assuming it's maybe a particular cloud, so, so maybe a Microsoft Azure or something. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's an interesting point, right? A lot of times, oh, multi-cloud, <laughs> okay, that makes sense, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, one of the first things you have to look at is, you know, where it does this cloud live, right? Um, and if you're, you're mostly an AWS shop and you say, okay, now we're doing business in this new country and they have data sovereignty laws that say their data cannot be stored outside of that country, well then often you'll have to go to Azure because they have uh, regions in more countries than, than any of the other cloud providers. Now it's easier for them to launch a region somewhere because their concept of region is much smaller than, than the others. Uh, they don't necessarily have multiple availability zones in a region. They have sort of local regions. It might be just one data center, right? But it's secured and everything else. So, so yeah, you're, you're right about that. Sometimes I, I might say, hey, I need to use cloud, but in that particular country, I'm going to have to use a different cloud provider, right? And so that, that could be uh, a good point. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that. Um, Oh, Tad says, uh, with Air, uh, OpenShift, same with Terraform, have to learn how to write infrastructure's code in the tool, and then you can leverage cloud and on-prem. Yeah, it, it is definitely, you know, uh, another hurdle, right? Because you have to learn, you know, the, the functionality of your cloud, and then you have to learn the functionality of, uh, like, a tool like Terraform on top of that. So that's sort of the, you know, the, the, the crux of the problem is, you know, what we're doing with these tools to fix our drawbacks, they're also introducing, you know, more cost, more time, more complexity themselves, right? Um, and I would say that, you know, these cloud management platforms, they try and be everything for everybody, but they're also introducing a layer, right? Which is not cheap, right? But also, you know, now you're saying, well, okay, I've got these workloads and I want you to go and run them somewhere. So there's a middleman in there and that middleman, we have to say, well, hey, now they've got access to all our data. Well, now we got to think about how, how secure is that? You know, we're, we're, we got to vet all that as well. So, um, you know, there, there is no silver bullet here, right? Multi-cloud is complex and expensive uh, and there are certainly drawbacks but there are some benefits as well. And what we're seeing is that, you know, through the use of the right kinds of things, and, and I'd say, you know, most of them at some low level, it's something based on Kubernetes that says, at least my application can be easily moved around. Um, 
you know, that's, that's our first step to really making something multi-cloud is to build an application that can easily live in any of those places. Right. So uh, training is definitely gonna be a big part of it, right? And that's, that's where we come in. Uh, we have training on all three of the major cloud providers and some of the others as well. Uh, I mentioned that we do Red Hat, so we have Ansible and OpenShift training. Uh, we got all these links. Uh, I think Michelle will probably drop those into the, uh, into the uh, chat. Um, and um, as well, we, we have a promo going on uh, until May 1st called Spring 20. It'll get you 20% off uh, instructor-led training. Uh, we got a link for that. I think she'll put that in, the, um, in there as well. Um, we, we run these webinars uh, fairly often. We, I guess the ones that would be pertinent to this are coming up probably early May. We've got a uh, VMware one, because uh, VMware, what, VMware 7's come out, so you know that's a big deal. So we've got a, uh, a webinar on that. Um, I think May 5th, oh, yeah, there. Yeah, should put it in, vSphere 7. Um, and then probably after that, we have one on Kubernetes, right? So if Kubernetes is something you're interested in, we have training on Kubernetes. Um, it's a little different, you know, like Exit Certified typically partners with the vendor of record and we have their courseware, right? And we have to register, uh, sort of uh, certify our instructors through their programs. Um, but when it comes to something open source like Kubernetes, there isn't just one vendor of record. You know, anybody can hang their sign and say, hey, we do Kubernetes training. So what we do in that case is we kind of look for the most official one, the one that we think is the best courseware. And for us, that was the Linux Foundation because they had partnered with the, uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation who's sort of in charge of Kubernetes. And they built some uh, two four-day classes, one for sort of app developers, one more for uh, Kubernetes administrators. And they also prep you for the uh, CNCF certification exams if that's you know of interest so so we have all that kind of training as well we're also a docker um uh training um partner so we've got docker classes uh oh we got a couple more questions uh do we have a strong business case for IaaS and and two cloud providers uh yeah yeah, yeah. like earlier on yes yeah. so, oh yeah he joined late um yeah i think probably the biggest ones are are you know sort of the, the four big draw uh, uh, benefits you know, just to recap, are, um, you know, sort of that idea that I don't want vendor lock-in, you know, because then I'm at the mercy of them for pricing or end of lining, you know, some sort of service that I was really important to me. But also that idea that um, um, you can uh, run workloads where they're cheapest for you. Uh, you have a little bit of risk uh, mitigation against the outage of one a provider versus another. Um, and then really just that idea of taking advantage of anything beyond the infrastructure as a service, you know. Um, and Cash says, you know, uh, oh yeah, around Ted's question, same, same kind of idea. Um, you know, something like Terraform, it's really letting you deploy to multiple clouds. It's not really managing. And so that's why I had those sort of four categories. The first one was just tools to help you you know, deploy to multiple clouds or building applications that can live in multiple clouds, but they're not true, you know, cloud management platforms, but that's a whole other level. But if you pair that with, you know, um, some good policies internally and a cloud uh, monitoring tool that monitors across all of them, and you've got good cost allocations, I mean, you know, you can kind of build up the same, same set of tools that a cloud management platform has. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I think that's probably everything. Uh, I'll just take more questions. Uh, we got about uh, eight minutes left. So if there's any other questions, throw them in the Q&A. Uh, did I miss anything from the chat? Some people were throwing things in the chat here. Um, oh, people were asking about the recording. Uh, yeah, later this week, you should get an email with the recording. So you'll have access to that. And uh, like I said, we've got, um, we've got a few more webinars coming up. Uh, they seem to be popular uh, right now because, uh, you know, I think people are working from home. It's a little easier to, to jump on a webinar. Um, oh, something else in the Q&A. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. If you have any other questions, we'll stick around for a few minutes. 
Thank you so much, Miles, and thank you everyone for your time today. As we said, we're going to be sending out a recording of the webinar to everyone that registered. Check out that Spring 20 promo, register in a class before May 1st, and you'll be eligible for 20% off. And it uh, looks like we have a couple more questions now. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, just a, just a note, any of those uh, links in the chat, as soon as you leave, the chat's gone. It doesn't save. So you might want to go and copy and paste some of those. Uh, Tad says, uh, would it make sense to leverage multi-cloud in a distributed uh, uh, fashion? Uh, have one application that one part of it is better for one vendor and another part's better with another? A web front end with the database back end somewhere else? Um, I, I think, I mean, I've seen a situation where people actually distributed even just the web apps across multiple vendors, but I think that's a real rarity, right? I think what you're doing is you're introducing, um, I guess, now if any one of those providers is down, your whole application's down, you know? So I, I, I think it introduces some other problems, but I think it's a natural consequence if people really embrace that concept of microservices. Um, and, and, you know, the way I've seen microservices done in, in some places, you know, you probably heard of the term two pizza teams where you get some developers, testers, some operations people together, and they're in, set of, they're in charge of this set of microservices from end to end, you know, from, from roadmap to gathering requirements, building it, testing it, deploying it to production, managing it in production. Right. Um, and typically when we embrace microservices, you know, that microservice is, is a sort of a small thing for this business. And then anything kind of major in business is, is you know, um, is really utilizing a bunch of the microservices put together in, in to make some sort of application. And if those microservices are in different places, that's fine. The problem comes when we're moving data between them, you know, so. You know, most of the cloud vendors, actually all the big ones, have the exact same model when it comes to data transfer, right? It doesn't cost me money to put data into AWS. So if I upload a bunch of files from my own data center into AWS, it, I don't pay any data transfer costs. I pay for storage, you know, once it gets there. And I don't pay anything for data transfer if I'm accessing that data from another, uh, like a virtual machine inside that same region. But if I'm, Passing data from one region to another, I pay a little bit of money. When I take data out of that cloud vendor, that's when I pay a lot, right? And so if you're moving data from one cloud to another, that's where it gets costly, right? And so if you're just doing it one time, you know, like I mentioned that idea where people have primarily AWS and all their data is in there, and then they pull a subset of that data, out, move it over to Google Cloud and do analytics there. Right. Ideally, what they're not doing is grabbing data again and again and pulling it over. They pull it over once and work on it, and then, you know, new data will also get duplicated. But then you're only paying that data transfer fee once. If I've got little applications running in every cloud and we're moving data back and forth all the time, I think you're going to see some real costs come up with that. Right. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And I think naturally, as a result of microservices and trying to compose microservices from different uh, parts of your organization that might be on different clouds, I think you're going to see some places have that. But I, I don't see the big benefit of it. I see a lot of drawbacks, you know. So that's, uh, I guess I've answered that as much as I can. Um, oh, uh, I don't think I can send the slides along, but they'll be in the recording, so you can kind of see them there. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, a few things. Yeah, just imagine the security issues or something happened. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, well, I'll, like I said, I'm sticking around a little bit longer. Uh, if you need to grab any of those links from the chat, you're going to want to grab them before before we shut down the call. Uh, also, I have my email address here. Let me throw that in the uh, chat to everybody. It's uh, miles.brown at techdata.com. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if you have sort of technical questions, we can, we can get into discussions. Otherwise, um, you know, if it's more of a sales kind of question, you're looking for training, I'll probably forward it on to one of our sales reps. And, uh, you know, we do, uh, we do, a lot of virtual training. We've been doing virtual training since 2012. Um, and um, 
uh, Zoom is sort of part of the, the overall, what we call IMVP. Um, and, um, you know, we've been doing them for a long time. We have people like Michelle who kind of make sure at the beginning of class, everybody's set, they have their materials, their AV is working. Uh, we really encourage people to turn on their, their cameras, unlike, you know, a webinar where I'm talking to 100 people. But generally in a class, you've got, you know, maybe, maybe 12, 15 people. Everyone gets their camera on. Even though we can't be in a physical training center, we've closed all our training centers currently, um, you know, we can do this. And so we've been doing this for many years. We do a lot of hybrid where, you know, when our classrooms are open, we might have, say, five people in class in a particular city and then another 10 people coming in remotely. So all of our instructors are very used to doing this kind of virtual training. Uh, but, you know, when things get back to normal, we'll have classroom training. And then a big part of it is, you know, companies want to bring somebody in. And so we'll send somebody to you if that's easier. So we, we have all those different training modalities. Um, and like I said, you know, we got a lot of different uh, vendors that we have authorized training for. And we are the training partner of the year for many of them. You know, AWS, Red Hat, VMware. IBM. Uh, so that's that's some of our big ones right there. All right. Uh, I think the questions are mostly shutting down. So I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Miles. I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay.